So we are here today to um, discuss a timely topic, getting in front of ESG requirements in 2022. Um, and we are joined by our own Fabian Komu. Uh, good to see you, Fabian, today. And Alison Rotney, Head of Corporate Responsibility at Tesco. Hello, Alison. How are you? Very good, thank you. Nice to join the seminar today. <laughs> Fantastic. So we have we have a, a full a full agenda uh, for 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 today. Um, actually, I'll, I'll just quickly go through some general housekeeping for for this uh, virtual event. Uh, then uh, we're going to have our conversation in two main segments. The first segment uh, will be a discussion uh, with our uh, speakers today on 2022 trends and ESG requirements. And then the second segment will be a bit more uh, specific on uh, how to build an ESG strategy for 2022. And of course, uh, we will hear from from Alison uh, today how uh, you know they're tackling this this challenging uh, task uh, for, uh, for 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 Tesco. But before going going in 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 our agenda, uh, as I said, let let me share about uh, our housekeeping rules. Um, you, we want. We, we love to interact with you, so uh, get your question ready. Um, you can use the Zoom chat box to interact with us, um, but there, there's also a Q&A uh, functionality. If there are any technical questions or difficulties, get in touch with our team. Uh, you can see the, the, their email address um, in, 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 in the slide. And uh, well, hopefully we won't have any technical dif difficulties. Um, as, and uh, finally, as, as a reminder, this event is being re recorded. Uh, also throughout the, the, the webinar, uh, there will be some polls as we like uh, to hear your, your, your opinion and your, and your views as well. Before starting with, 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 with the agenda today, uh, you know, a, a, couple, a couple of uh, slides for uh, those that don't know Datamon so they can get familiar with us. Uh, so Datamon is a cloud-based platform. Uh, we are um, a software as a service um, technology company. Uh, we work with many of the Fortune 500 companies, uh, as you can see here, including including Tesco uh, today with us. Uh, in terms of what kind of solution we provide, uh, we use natural language processing. We have a patented technology uh, that leverages artificial intelligence to analyze the narrative around ESG factors in a variety of publicly available data sets, including corporate annual reports, mandatory regulation, voluntary policies, and online news. Uh, thanks to our technology, uh, our clients are able to identify trends, uh, material issues, and emerging risks uh, for, uh, for their uh, or, or organization. Uh, in terms of how the clients use data, you will hear this in a much more uh, you know, practical and insightful way from, from Alison today. Anyway, it's really to enable the process that starts with uh, the identification of your priorities. Some companies call this a materiality assessment. Some other companies are quite allergic to that term. In any case, it, it's, it's about identifying what really matters for you as a company, what should be in your risk register, what should be in your, in your uh, board conversation, what, you sh what should be in your, in your strategy as well. Then the, the next step is understanding what other risks associated to these, uh, to these issues. And of course, the third step is about communicating all of this internally and externally. Then finally, this is not a one-off one kind of analysis, but it's really an ongoing monitoring exercise. So data has monitoring capabilities that enable our clients to actually see how trends uh, evolve over time. But as I said, this is quite you know, abstract at this point, but we'll see it in action um, later on in, 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 in the webinar. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen so we can get uh, in, in the conversation today. Um, and just to, to start with, uh, some considerations. We're talking about ESG requirements, right? Um, and requirements, we, we're, we're talking about them uh, in, in, a, in a broad sense. Uh, so of course, there is a side of ESG requirements that is related to regulation and policy, and this is a very busy year uh, from a policy development agenda. We're all waiting for, uh, you know, the details of the corporate sustainability reporting directive in Europe, but also the US SEC promised uh, their their first climate rule and mandatory disclosure requirements on climate. Rumors are rumor as it that 
it's going in, it is going to be live next week, uh, so b b very soon uh, in, in that sense. But besides those regulatory developments, there are also other, other developments. Um, and this period, you know, with all the geopolitical events that we're seeing, the dramatic war in, in Ukraine, uh, is, is turning out to be a moment of truth for, for ESG, right? With, 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 with pressure, additional pressure on companies to actually demonstrate that they're walking the talk when it comes to following through their ESG, ESG commitments. Uh, so requirements seems to be quite, quite high in, uh, um, in, 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 in 2022 for, 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 for ESG. And of course, we will hear from, from our speakers today what they think about this and how this is impacting their, their organization. But before going there, uh, we, we want to hear from you, from the audience, actually, what you think. Uh, so we're, we're going to launch our first poll now. And you should be able to see um, the poll now that is asking you, what is the ESG trend that is receiving the most attention from the leadership in your organization? Uh, and we have you know, listed some examples. Of course, there's no ambition to be exhaustive here because there are so many. Uh, however, uh, you can see we have climate risk, decarbonization, and race to net zero that uh, currently is you know, leading <laughs> in terms of, of the responses. Uh, then we have double materiality, sustainable finance, and then new ESG reporting standards. Uh, we also have a you know, residual category, other. If you have other ideas that we didn't feature in our poll, uh, you, 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 can, you can put those in, in the chat. Um, I think we have now around 60% of the participants responded, so we can end the poll and share the results. So as you can see, we have dominant majority for climate risk, decarbonization, rates to net zero. I guess this is, you know, further... Um, further, further confirmation that uh, the climate issue is top material issue right now. Uh, double materiality is a minority, so it's only four percent. Then we have sustainable finance um, and new ESG reporting standards is actually taking quite, quite, a, quite a bit of, 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 of attention. I can see some people from the audience that are actually chatting. Additional, uh, additional elements we have. Organizational diversity and inclusion uh, is right up there too, and I, I agree with you, Susie. That's another very important trend. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. Uh, enough of me. Uh, so let's 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 hear from from our panelists. Uh, Alison, sh shall we start with you? What, what what do you think of these results and how you know these developments are actually impacting uh, Tesco? Yeah, so I guess just to, to background, like Tesco, hopefully everyone's fully aware of, of who Tesco is. Um, we're the, the UK's largest retailer, food retailer, um, and we have uh, markets in, in Central Europe, in, in Hungary, Slovakia and Czech Republic, um, also in, in Ireland and the UK. Um, and I mean, sustainability has been core to Tesco for a long, long time. Um, and I think it's it, it's fair that it's, it has very much been part of our approach, our purpose and our strategy, but it really has ramped up in the last couple of years, really, that ESG, sustainability, call it what you will, has really become a kind of leading issue for all of our stakeholder groups. Um, we've certainly seen a noticeable uptake in investor interest in ESG, um, and particularly they are keen to understand what really matters to us and why um, because there are so many different issues so that poll obviously only had three or four listed there are so many and the, the the chats obviously identified a number more so you know how do we as a business navigate all of the issues and which are most material most important to us um, and our, our you know we've been really fortunate our board and our exec fully appreciate the, the importance of this agenda to our, our long-term business success. And um, in light of that, this year, um, we've actually refreshed our purpose. Um, so, you know, to, to really reflect the commitment that we have to sustainable value creation across 
you know, that embraces the demands of both the people and, and the planet, we've enhanced our purpose now to talk around serving our customers, communities, and the planet a little bit every day. And that's, that's in recognition of actually just how central ESG now is to, in, is to our business. I mean, it's interesting that climate got, got pulled up there as a really core issue. It absolutely is front and center for us. Um, we've announced a number of net zero um, ambitions um, recently, and we've enhanced our governance framework around our, what we're doing on climate to reflect actually just how much of a, of a risk and opportunity it presents to our business. Um, I think when it comes to climate, TCFD obviously, you know, came about in 2017. We were one of the first companies to kind of sign up and pledge support to the recommendations. And I think actually as a business, we've taken some learnings from being a bit of an early adopter of, that, of those recommendations. And now that, as you say, like the regulations are developing and actually it's becoming a mandatory requirement to talk around climate now, we're pretty well set up to comply with those regulations. And actually, we're, we're trying to take the learnings that, from that process and apply them to all of this other, the, the wealth of other regulations that are coming down the pipeline. So you mentioned the likes of the, the Corporate Sustainability Directive, the, you know, we've got obviously all the various taxonomies and the SFDR, which actually indirectly affects us because it affects our investors and they're asking us for information. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really kind of, <laughs> confusing place to kind of identify what what issues are most material but certainly climate resonates with us as well uh, for sure that that, that 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 that's great thank you thank you for those insights uh, Alison and and uh, you know I, I I noted down uh, you know these changes are actually impacting Tesco because of you know renewed investors interest uh, renew leadership interest um, as well on, on those on those aspects but as you say, it's, it's an increasingly complex uh, landscape that is very difficult to, uh, to navigate. And I think one of the dynamics that is making it even more difficult is the flood of ESG frameworks, solution standards, providers, vendors that we're seeing. And it, it's very difficult to you know, navigate and, and distinguish between what is a nice to have and a must, must have. Uh, I think you started to talk about this when you said, you know, we we, we decided to uh, um, refresh our our purpose, and that that's probably a must have. Actually, coincidentally, today I was reading that BlackRock uh, just published a letter where they they said they will engage with leadership uh, of companies about their purpose. So, purpose is certainly a, a, a must have in you know the ESG toolbox of your of your organization, but what else would you suggest is also a must have there? I think you, beyond the purpose, it also feeds through into the strategy side of things. So um, linked to, to the delivery of our, our updated purpose, we've also refreshed our corporate strategy. And an element of that is what we call magnetic value. And within that, we kind of uh, redefine what value means to our customers. So it's not just about great price and quality and, and availability for, for our customers. It's about actually producing healthy, sustainable foods for our customers. It's about reducing the environmental impact of the products that we sell and, and how we operate and also how we support our community. So it's, it, it, it's now not just a, a nice slogan as a purpose piece, it's actually really baked into the strategy and the business plans that then deliver that strategy. So across all of the business, the functions that we've got, magnetic value now is a leading driver that we, everyone has to kind of um, signpost to and indicate how we are delivering against that. I think not just on the strategy side, you've also got to consider the governance piece as well. So um, linked to my reference around the TCFD side, you know, governance is another big area that they look at and, um, you know, ensuring that ESG really is, you know, kind of baked into a really robust governance um, framework where the board and exec have full accountability for delivery is, a, I think, a, you know, what needs to happen in order to deliver. Um, We've just, going back to the climate point, we've just enhanced our um, climate governance framework in light of just how much we need to do, uh, particularly in the scope three side of things. 
that actually we need a, a kind of an enhanced governance piece to actually ensure that we deliver against our net zero ambitions. We've also, alongside the governance piece uh, and the strategy, we have to look at the metrics and targets as well. So, you know, it's that age old saying of what gets, you know, kind of measured gets ma managed, um, you know, setting smart ESG KPIs, yeah, I think is what we increasingly are being asked for from our, from again, investors, like you say, there's, there's so much data out there that for a lot of stakeholders, it's really difficult to be able to compare like one company versus their peers, how, you know, and, and, and actually I think the calls and we're on the camp for this as well in terms of bringing greater standardization across what data points everyone needs to report against so that it's a fair playing field, I think is definitely um, on the cards with all of these different regulations and frameworks um, in the pipeline. And then I guess the, the fourth area as well of interest that we've got is the materiality point. So going back to focusing on really the issues that matter because you can try and do as much as you like on everything, but actually you really wanna make a big difference. And for us, that's, that's absolutely what we want to do. We need to focus um, our resources and you know and, and our attention on the material issues for us that represent either risk or or opportunity and I think that's one of the things that really has led us down to the point of of making use of the data moran system as well and, and we're going we're going to be back on that in in the next part of, of our conversation but I, I like a lot what you've been saying about strategy governance materiality and then metrics and, and, and kpis in terms of you know the must have I, I think often people focus a lot on the operational side of esg you know measuring things or disclosing kpis without connecting all of that to strategy and that essentially creates a silo uh, that ticks the box but is not really making any any change or impact uh, so I would like to ask Fabian, actually, of course, Fabian is a, is a, is a member of Datamaran, uh, so uh, he won't be talking about the, the, the Datamaran, but he is a bit the voice of our community of, of, of clients. So Fabian, from your vantage point as uh, you know, member of, of, of the customer success team, how do you see these trends uh, affecting uh, you know, the other clients um, and, and the organizations uh, you work with? Yeah, no, it's a good question, Donato. And uh, to your point, and just to add for extra context, um, the client base I work with, they work in every kind of industry and sector um, imaginable. They're not all, all from the same bunch. So the point about that there are many different approaches to addressing this ever-changing landscape is like the point that they need to connect ESG um, to the company's overall strategy. And that's the point Alison was mentioning earlier. Like there seems to be like a real appetite to integrate ESG to not, if not all business units, um, and this is a shift for a sustainable future. Um, it now becomes unignorable. So within the companies I actually work closely with, the need to identify and monitor your ESG risks and opportunities seems to be of paramount importance. So whilst Data Moran and the, and the solution itself automates this process. The bit that I find most interesting is how these insights are then used. So as Alison mentioned, uh, some of the clients actually report directly into the board or steering committees to ensure that the insights achieved uh, with data ran are integrated into a more strategic process like Alison is and Tesco. Um, Alison also mentioned it before, others work closely with investor relations to ensure that there is ESG appetite from their, share, from their shareholders um, is met. Whereas other more of my clients are actually risk teams and risk owners themselves. And they actually use data around to monitor for blind spots and emerging risks. But I'd say one of the key things is that anyone working in this ESG space will know that the conversation has shifted dramatically over the past couple of years. When I kind of started this journey, everyone thought VSG is a simple tick boxing exercise, um, where essentially it's just people evaluating their ESG issues once every couple of years, doing some desk research and just pressing control F into Google. Um, this is something of the past. Uh, the new normal that I've seen, uh, especially within my community of clients and Tesco and Allison themselves is that 
there's a real appetite for data-driven insights that can be really and easily communicated uh, across a company and woven into its strategy. Um, but it seems as if, if we're going to talk about the past and we've spoken about the present, the one thing that I think all of my clients and the whole community need to address is the future and the now. Um, it's an article you really mentioned the uh, war going on in Ukraine. And if we apply a double materiality perspective to this crisis, we see that businesses will be affected both financially, um, the outside in perspective, but also within the ESG sense, the uh, inside out perspective. So since the war in Ukraine has started, our clients have been asked to demonstrate that they're honest about their ESG commitments. And you've touched upon this at the start. So now is the time for action and for business leaders to reflect upon and evaluate some really, really tough questions. The main point being, how are our business operations influencing this crisis? And when hopefully this crisis is over, what is our response going to be? To conclude, I, I kind of see, uh, kind of foresee that those in the data marine community will leverage our real-time data to kind of clarify and solidify their ESG position at a time where companies have really been asked to spell out what their ESG commitments really mean. Yeah, but to, to the point what we're making we we're making earlier is you know it's a sort of moment of truth. And you know, we're seeing we're seeing clients actually, you know, think, think, re, re re-establishing again their priorities and, and you know re, re, reassessing their strategy as well. And, and I think this this is is a nice uh, segue to the uh, second segment of, of our conversation, which is, you know, this is the context, right? Uh, the, the, the trends that are that are uh, happening right, right now, but how to practically translate all of that into building strategy, right? What, what is the, the, the magic formula, the secret recipe uh, there? So uh, before before going there and hearing from, from, from Alison how, 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 how they're doing it at, at Tesco, um, we, we, we would like to launch our second poll so we can hear from, from, from our audience today. And well, this, 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 uh, this poll will help us to understand, you know, where, where are you now in your journey? Are you planning to build or update your ESG strategy this year? I guess many, many of you are probably right now reassessing this question in light of the recent event. Uh, and the fact, and then I think that speaks to the fact that you know the ESG landscape is ever evolving. It's it's difficult to stick, you know, with the same priorities for for, for, for long. All right, Let's see a lot of responses coming in. Uh, so I'll, I'll just allow some additional seconds. And I think we have a clear winner, so we can end the poll now and share the results. All right, so, well, 80% of the respondents uh, said yes, uh, they're uh, planning to, up, uh, to build and update their ESG strategy. Uh, only a minority says no, and then th there is a part that is undecided. So th there you go, Alison. I, I mean, these these people, I, I think they, they will be listening to you very carefully as they're thinking about th their strategy. So you know, they can hear from you, uh, you know, how you're you're tackling uh, this at, at, at Tesco and what, what advice um, uh, you you uh, you can give. Sure. I think, I mean, first and foremost, the, the point I guess I would stress is that we are very much on a journey. This is not a case that we are presenting a, a, a polished strategy here that um, is perfect by any means, that we recognise that there is so much to do in this space. And um, with the different regulations potentially coming down the force and the different stakeholder interests, we have to kind of focus on certain areas and then move on and, and kind of develop the strategy over time. Um, like I mentioned, so, so last year, the purpose side of things really kicked things off. So the, we, we landed on the new purpose and the new strategy that then really kind of um, built the foundations on which we needed to identify, okay, so we want to ensure that the planet and the communities and our customers are really, you know, kind of uh, served well every day, but what does that really mean for us? And what areas do we need to focus on 
um, to, to really make the biggest impact. So at Tesco previously, we, um, we called our ESG strategy the Little Helps Plan. So it's all about kind of all of the little helps stack up to make a big difference. Um, as we've evolved and, uh, and our um, upcoming reports and such will, will, will show this, is that we're, we're definitely shifting towards greater integration of, of ESG across the piece. Um, and actually, um, we want to, to demonstrate how it links back to that magnetic value that I pointed to earlier. So we, we said, OK, right, we need to complete a materiality exercise to help us identify the big ticket items that we want to focus on and, and why. And historically, we've approached materiality in the traditional sense, where, where many of our peers obviously do as well, whereby we've interviewed stakeholders, we've run surveys, we've kind of gathered insight that way. And whilst, you know, it's a really valuable exercise to do, it's time consuming, it's costly, and inevitably it's out of date fairly quickly because it's, you know, with these sorts of things, surveys are as good as the day that you run them. Something could change, and to your point, Fabian, you know, things that are happening in the outside world and, and the Ukraine conflict is, is just testament to that, that things, it throws curveballs and, and things get kind of prioritized or deprioritized as a result. So we wanted to, to, to actually make use of a more um data-driven approach that was um, more dynamic in it, in its kind of the listening and the capturing of of those of those data points so we reached out to, to, to data around to help us with that and we've obviously kind of um started the process in terms of running the matrix and um creating a list of of which areas we've deemed to be kind of material to our business and building plans accordingly um, and I don't know if you want me to share the screen as yet or, or, or what in terms of building um, the matrix. I, 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 think, I think our audience will be very curious to uh, see the work you've done. Sure. Um, right. Stand by. Hopefully this, uh, this works. Yep. Because yeah. Seems yeah, <laughs> excellent. Um, so this is the, the output and, and I am not here on, on, on behalf of Dave Moran in terms of explaining all of the, the systems that sits behind this and the analysis. So um, I'll, I'll leave that to Fabian Donati to explain, but this is the output that we as a business are, are kind of using to help us um, work through our ESG strategy going forward. So as in, I guess um, the basic process that we went through to create this analysis was um, the data around system comes up with some mapping of issues for the various different industries and the food and beverage that we are 80% of our, our business is linked to the food and beverage industry and therefore we ran our analysis against that mapping. Um, we did um, modify it somewhat to reflect how we define issues. So I think one of the good things within the system is that it allows for that kind of um, customize, customization um, of, of the issues that are in there. And, and again, to ensure that it landed right with our, with our colleagues and, and our senior leaders was that we were applying the right language. So the system talks around employees and things like that. We, we talk about colleagues. So it's, it's even just as small things in terms of language that really land the point with, with the right people. We then um, ran through in terms of establishing the stakeholders that we wanted to consider as part of our review. So the, the system, as, as, as Donata kind of explained, picks up the, the four main stakeholder groups of industry, media, policymakers, and regulators. We wanted to enhance that and, and again, make sure that we picked up the kind of stakeholders that we were, we were keen on, on including. So we applied the, the investor lens as well, well and we did that um, and the system picks up the SASB framework as the kind of leading in, uh, indicator to help prioritize the issues that, that the SASB framework um, considers. And we also looked at suppliers. So we provided a list of our top 100 suppliers um, and the, the data around guys, um, Fabian did a great job in terms of kind of pulling those through and making sure that the suppliers um, the system was scraping those suppliers as part of the analysis um, off of their public information. We, we did, obviously, customers as a big stakeholder group, as is our colleagues. 
for this first initial analysis that we have done, we didn't include those, those groups. Um, and there was a number of reasons for doing that. Principally, the, um, the customer side, we gather a lot of insight around our customers. And um, it was actually quite difficult to overlay that existing insight with the system itself. So we've actually done that more on a manual basis. Um, looking at what our, that insight tells us, overlaying with this kind of analysis and, and identifying any gaps and, and working out what that might mean for us. Colleagues, we are looking at um, potentially as a next step of running some kind of survey. And again, the system does allow us to do that in terms of gathering insight to plot this, to plot against this. But I would say we did get a, an element of colleague input into this because once we created this first analysis piece we socialized it with the right people around the business to ensure that the, the issues were showing up where they would expect them to show up um, and then we were able to kind of um, tweak them so somewhat to, to ensure particularly along that, that x-axis they were where we wanted them to be. Um, the scope of our analysis as I mentioned before we're a re retailer with kind of global operations to somewhat so we ensured that the, the geographies that we um, are present in were picked up um, as, um, as is our, our business units as well. So we have a telecommunications business and we have a bank, Tesco Bank, and they're making sure that those elements of the group uh, function were also included within this. Um, and one great thing is that the system allows for waiting. So we were able to, again, weight those stakeholder groups accordingly and, and weight those um, those industry contributions. So as I said before, we are heavily a uh, food retailer and therefore we needed to ensure that for the Tesco group analysis, it was skewed in that in, in that response in that respect. Um, but we have subsequently been able to again create analysis that are um, specific to the different business units. So we've done a Tesco bank analysis and we've done a telecommunications one to so just to be able to, to see what differences there are really in terms of our Tesco bank facing into a, you know, any big issues that the group are just completely unaware of and, and, and whether or not there's any kind of um, gaps and, and misalignment. So as I say, we, we've kind of created this, this, this first analysis, we've socialized it with the right people around the business, um, and we are now using this to identify the leading issues for us um, against the magnetic driver strategy then which I mentioned. So for us, we've identified really climate, healthy, sustainable diets, diversity and inclusion, and um, waste, be that packaging and, and food waste is really the key big issues that we are now going to um, hook all of our corporate reporting around in a sense. The other raft of issues that obviously we still need to disclose against, we still need to do uh, take action, we are managing in a slightly different way. So our ESG strategy is now kind of pinned on those, those four core material issue areas and the, the plethora of other ESG issues are picked up through our mainstream kind of our disclosures for our website and um, through our everyday risk management processes and policies and, and, and kind of compliance piece. So we, we're tackling it in almost two parts from example, using the output of, of this analysis. I've, I've whipped through that. I don't know if that was <laughs> clear. It, 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 was, it was super clear and, and, and detailed. And I, I, I can see some, some questions uh, com, coming up. Perhaps uh, there are some uh, that are quite practical that, that we could address right now. Uh, so uh, one attendee asked, how often do you update the analysis? Um, and another one is asking, how long does it take to, to create that kind of analysis? Um, uh, I'll be honest, at the very beginning, obviously being new to the system, it took a bit longer, but the, the system is fairly intuitive. Um, and, I, and I'm sure you guys will, again, attest to the various different further developments that you've got in the pipeline potentially to, to make it slightly easier on the user, because there are, I won't, you know, there are areas where there was more manual intervention that, you know, again, from a, from a user perspective, it would save an awful lot of time to be able to just to, to, to apply the same analysis across 
um, various different industries where you have to rerun them or, or whatnot. So in, in essence, it, took, it doesn't take very long at all. Um, it's, you know, it, 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 it would take us, maybe we pulled that, that analysis together with the socialization across our exec and, and, and senior leaders in about a fortnight uh, in terms of working in our, our supplier piece, running the analysis, sense checking it and kind of um, and, and stress testing it against our existing insight and then doing that socialization piece. So it's really quick. And one of the things as well is that you can rerun it at any time because like we say, it's kind of, it's always on, it's always listening, it's always picking up these various data points. And again, we have rerun it just to check that there's not thrown out and the, the, the four issue areas that we're wanting to focus on has suddenly fallen off the radar and they're no longer relevant. And frankly, that's, that's of course not the case. Fantastic. And, and, and while you were talking, you were, you were um, explaining how um, your, you know, your plan is to connect these insights uh, with you know, also your, your, risk, your, your risk assessment. Um, and of course, that is a process that uh, you, st you still have to go through. Can you, can you explain why you want to make uh, that, 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 that connection? Why you think it's, it's important from a strategic point of view? Sorry, I missed the first part of that. Um, it, it's, it's about connecting uh, the results of your materiality assessment with uh, with work with risk management. Um, yeah. Right. So so again, from um, we're on the journey as I mentioned, and this system can very much be seen as not only a materiality exercise but also very much a risk management tool as well in terms of uh, certainly feeding information through into the risk management processes. We are um, currently working with our risk team to understand the output from the system and how it can feed into our, our corporate risk registers and, and then kind of management process. Um, we're not there yet. We haven't fully kind of overlaid the risks that have identified through the system and the dashboard that the Data Moran system kicks out versus our universe of risks in a sense and, and, and how they overlay because they will be different inevitably. Um, and so we're, we're still working through what that could mean, but there's certainly appetite to do that. There's definitely, we see value in using that information that's readily available within the tool and applying some of that into um, helping us differentiate between kind of the principal risks and, and other risks uh, um, that we manage. And, 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 and I think, you know, that, that is extremely important in the context of, you know, reconnecting everything uh, to strategy, as, as we were saying uh, uh, b before. Perhaps, uh, you know, I can, I can uh, visualize for, for our audience how that looks like in, in the platform. Uh, so let me, let me share my screen. Uh, and we can, we can give you a, a preview of what that looks like. And of course, what I'm showing here now, it's, it's not Tesco. This is my, my, my application. Uh, but essentially, the, what data one does, once you create your materiality assessment, it will populate uh, ESG risk universe uh, for you that organizes the material issues according to the likelihood of a risk event in relation to these issues. So in short, this means that under this action required area, you will find those issues that are more likely uh, to have a risk event uh, connected to them. Uh, which kind of risk event? Well, if, we, if you click on one of these issues, uh, they then will, will tell you what are the risk drivers associated to it. So for example, if we take here climate change and, and GFG emissions, uh, we can see in my example that 31% of the likelihood is influenced by long-term regulation risk. And why is that the case? Well, because there are a number of voluntary policies that are addressing uh, this specific issue. Uh, and of course, Datamo will give you all the information about these policies, including descriptions, links, uh, related initiatives. So again, in order to navigate that complexity, we, we, we try to make that easier uh, for, uh, for, 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 for our clients. Um, and same applies to uh, to the other risk drivers: competitive risk, 
reputational risk, short-term regulation risk. I don't want to hijack the, 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 the conversation today, but as Alison said, if, if, you, if you want to know more about how this works uh, technically, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, and we can, we can uh, of course, organize a demo session. And uh, uh, what's also important, as some of, of, of the members of the audience were asking how often you can do this, and Alison, you had the great response. Uh, you know, issues are shifting all the time, so you want to keep a pulse on what's happening. Uh, we also have monitoring abilities that will tell um, what are the issues that have seen an increase in the likelihood of a risk event in relation to them. Uh, so in my demo example here, I, I'm observing a period of, you know, one month and three days, and I can see that those three issues increase their likelihood. And if I click on one, I'll get information on what is changing. Uh, so I can see an increase in, in, in the score of likelihood that is driven by new corporate reports that are covering a specific topic, in this case, uh, social, uh, social inclusion. So this is how Datamart enables uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, that sort of uh, monitoring of, of, of emerging issues. I, I, I'll pause here also because I, I want to ask Fabian, uh, as uh, uh, you know, the voice of uh, our community, it is it, it. You know, we often hear that uh, companies are are on a journey, and also Alison made a, made a point in, uh, in that. And often, um, you know, there may be a, a sort of uh, you know expectation that sophistication and technology is available only to uh, to leaders uh, like like Tesco, uh, but. Do you, do you see that among among our among among our clients are only leaders that are uh, you know being so data driven or is it something that actually all, all sort of organization can use? Um, to, to to give you the short answer, no. But I'm sure you're going to push me for the long answer. So um, uh, to give you the long answer, um, as mentioned before, I manage, uh, I manage around thirty odd clients within Data Run, and they work in every sector imaginable. So everyone's in a completely different stage of integrating ESG into their company strategy. Um, on one side, I have a number of clients who see uh, materiality and ESG as a strategic tool. Um, these kind of clients, their boards care deeply um, about its results, and I've done so for a number of years. It's kind of what they do. But on the, on the other side, I also have clients who um, are kind of in the infancy of their ESG journey and are only beginning to periodically monitor um, their ESG risks and opportunities now. So obviously these are the two extremes and the vast majority of companies um, actually sit somewhere in the middle of these two parts. Uh, but what I would say is the common thread, I'd say that connects all of Data Moran's clients is the desire to step into the here and now um, and utilize the technology and tools we actually have available to us. Um, and the benefit of having those real-time insights uh, gives our clients the opportunity to be more proactive with them. Um, I've actually got a quote here written down on the corner of the page that I wanted to read out, um, knowing that uh, this is something that's a question that's always asked. Um, and it's actually EFRAG's report, um, October report, on the good practices for ESG reporting. And it says um, there is an insufficient deployment of possible technical uh, technological solutions to report sustainability information. So when I read that, and what I think is, is data brand clients actually understand this um, and are at the forefront of best reporting practices. So therefore I put to you and everyone listening on this webinar today that a data-driven materiality analysis isn't just for leaders like Tesco, um, it's just for those who are aligned with good reporting practices. Thank, thank, thank you, Fabian. Um, all right, so I think we we perhaps have a, a one or two minutes, although you know I see that we're getting close to, to an end, uh, to get some of the questions from the audience. Uh, we we do have a number of questions in Q and A, uh, but uh, perhaps we can pick some here. I don't think we have the time to address all of them. Just to give a summary, we have a nice. Uh, uh, you know, collection of questions. Some of these are quite philosophical, um, re reflecting on the conflation of uh, ESG and sustainability. That's that's a great question, Reno. Uh, I, you know, I, I reserve my right to answer you via email because it, it deserves a longer, <laughs> a longer answer. 
Um, another one about ESG thresholds and allocation. I quite like the question from David Willens to uh, uh, Alison. Um, and uh, David is asking, is it more important to your exec and senior leaders to be doing better than their peers or do they care more about improving on the key material issues? Uh, I think that's a great yeah. question. It is, it is. And inevitably, there's an, there's an element of kind of competitiveness in terms of, you know, kind of wanting to, to ensure that we, we do demonstrate leadership in this space. However, you know, I think they are very much kind of clear on what we need to do and why we need to do it, regardless of how others are approaching this task or what their focus areas are, because we have grounded our focus on the data and the science and the insight and in fact we are increasingly working with our peers on some of these big issues so you know inevitably we can't do everything on our own and it does require collaboration and kind of partnerships across the piece so you know the we we were part of um, the WWF partnership, for example, on um, creating a sustainable basket metric to reduce the environmental impact of the UK shopping basket. We worked with the WWF four years ago to help to develop that this tool, and has since been updated to um, the retail standard that now other retailers are buying into, and we are also kind of updating our basket metric to reflect now the retailer one so so you know we're very much about yes we want to lead but actually not if it's if it you know we're very much about sharing information with our peers and bringing everyone on the journey if it's to actually achieve the end goal of tackling some of these issues such as climate such as nature loss you know these are these this does need everyone to be to be part of the solution that, that, that's a great answer, uh, uh, Alison. And I, and I think, I mean, being realistic, of course, when it comes to sustainability, we, we all want to cooperate and we don't see that as a competitive arena. But I would say in a, in, in a pragmatic way, if, uh, uh, you know, it's, if it is a competition to achieve impact, then I guess that that, that could be uh, something something that ultimately benefits the old society and, and the and the and, and environment. The important is the important things that we don't we enable race to the bottom or or uh, you know competition uh, arenas where you know I win you lose kind of mechanisms. Uh, I, I I I I guess. All right. So I I think uh, we are running out of time. Uh, I will just ask you since you know we have. I think 80% of the people attending are in, 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 in the process of updating the, the, the strategy. Alison, Fabian, if you have, you know, in one sentence and, and a piece of advice that you will give to your colleagues that are working on, on this, what would you say? You Maybe first? you can go first. <laughs> um, I can have two answers. One's a bit biased. Obviously, use data ran, but uh, that's obviously a bit biased. Um, the second bit is um, maybe, to be fair, it's attached to it. Use technology. Um, the amount of times I speak to, the first time I speak to anyone when they use the platform is, it's just so much better. I'm, instead of doing desk research, instead of doing control F, um, I'm getting machine learning. I'm using uh, technology to do it for me. It saves a lot of time to use technology. Um, we're in the 21st century now. I've said it before, kind of step into the present is my recommendation. And you stay some random. I won't go down that route in terms of obviously <laughs> pushing for the day from but certainly I think making use of, of, of tools and systems is, is definitely the way to go. But certainly also the frameworks that are obviously being developed at the moment, I think, um, it's inevitable that we are going to get standardization and consolidation of, of the various reporting frameworks and standards. I think it's worthy of kind of paying attention to the ISSB um, developments and, and kind of using that as a good proxy for, for where reporting is going to go and, and kind of um, focusing on, on the recommendations that are, that are kind of associated with that. And I think, I guess the last thing is that um, I don't think anyone knows all the answers as well and that you know this is a number of these developments are still some way off 
and still there's an element of uncertainty around them. So don't panic that you don't know everything. Um, we certainly don't. Like we, we work again with the experts, we work with our industry bodies, we work with our peers to, to try and un, unravel everything that's going on in this space. But it is about kind of prioritizing where you can kind of tackle the issue, build your reporting around and the clear requirements of us today and um, with a light of kind of where things are shaping up into the future. Awesome. And so if I may summarize, don't panic, use data. Uh, love, love this. And on that note, I wish everybody a, a you know, good, good a continuation of your working day and, and week. See you, see you soon. Thank you.